Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Managing Director at Standard Charter Bank, Heidi Torabio. That's a warm welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Heidi Torabio. I'm a Managing Director at Standard Chartered and I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to all of you and invite you to in the discussion that we're about to have on the evolution of leadership. As we prepare for the discussion, I'd like to bring your att attention to a critical lever for the future of leadership, which was the second annual Milken Women's Leadership Summit that we had yesterday. 300 leaders uh, and rising stars in business and finance gathered to address the global uh, rapid uh, technology changes that are underway. We called it a world in transition, inspiring action and change. There were three themes that we, we identified throughout the day, inclusion, inspiration, and adaptability. There's a need to change the dialogue and focus on inclusion, not diversity. It's no longer enough to invite women to join and be part of the table. It's about wanting, and wanting to listen to what they have to say. We need to shape more content and have it more meaningfully directed in thinking about how people learn and change the ways that, in ways that make sense to them. We're drowning in information, but we're starving for wisdom. Using our influence as finance professionals to help shape infrastructure, policies, and regulations to ensure the right people have access to sustainable financing and recognizing women's rights are human rights. Discussions focused on topics that are relevant for all leaders, many of which will be addressed today and also throughout the rest of the summit. What are we doing to help our communities and the next generation of leaders adopt and aspire them to thrive? I participated in a panel with four other leaders representing public, nonprofit, and financial institutions, sharing our efforts to promote inclusion to this often overlooked and displaced population of women. The world is moving forward, but how will we ensure that we don't leave anyone behind? How do we position ourselves and share our narrative and adapt the business priorities through changing times? We are all leaders in our different domains. It's our responsibility to bring our best ideas and creativity together to be part of the exponential change and growth that lies ahead of us. The way we communicate and the stories we tell are no longer linear. We need to adapt to a more dynamic and authentic approach to connect and inspire. We need to tell the truth. FinTech and disruptions in finance were discussed as well. Financial services are how economies thrive. We create prosperity. Our challenge is to evolve our thinking and embrace the many positive disruptions that FinTech offers while also ensuring that we understand the potential risks that it brings. Michael Milken presented his reflections on building meaningful lives, highlighting the evolution of the world's demographics, economies, educations, and values over time. We also discussed working smarter in the future of jobs. The rise in technology will require a new mindset and skill set Landscapes of, as landscapes of employment uh, transform. We need new methods of training and keeping up with the pace of advancement in technology and moving more to growth mindsets from fixed mindsets. Thank you for allowing me to share some of these insights that the Milken Women's Leader in, uh, Summit had. And in today's, as today's panel commences, I, I would propose that everyone in this room consider how to include more women in the dialogue and to help shape the evolution of leadership. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's panel, producer and presenter of the BBC World News and president of the Foreign Correspondents Association of Singapore, Sharanjit Lyle. Thank you so much for that, Heidi. Really appreciate it. And wow, a packed room. And we are interrupting your lunch, but I hope it will be an engaging and insightful uh, interruption for the next uh, hour or so. 
uh, we have on stage with us these amazing people. And first off, I'd like to uh, thank Michael Milken and the Milken team for bringing us all here together today. Out there doing a fabulous job. That's right. So you guys have been enjoying all the panels and getting a lot of insights throughout the day, and uh, hopefully you will again uh, this session. Now this is a panel about the evolution of leadership, and uh, I'm sure you can see on the stage here, we've got a writer and an activist, a uh, visionary uh, philanthropist, a uh, quantitative financial guru, and one of the world's best known sports stars. I mean, how incredible is that? So we have the challenge over the next hour to try to bring together a sense of the leadership qualities required from all of these myriad roles. Or maybe at the end of the session we'll discover actually uh, leadership qualities are pretty much the same whatever industry you're in. So this will be the challenge. And as we explore the evolution of leadership, uh, we think we all know what makes a good or bad leader, right? I mean, all of you in this room, uh, no political agenda here, but all of you in this room pretty much have an idea or an opinion on the current leader of the free world, the man who's currently in the White House, right? You all do, good or bad. Uh, and of course we know about corporate leaders who've been brought down in scandal. You know, you've got uh, the scrutiny of social media, the hashtag campaigns like Me Too, for instance, and Harvey Weinstein. So all of these issues we're going to be exploring because uh, of course the role of leadership is so different now that you have uh, such an unprecedented level of scrutiny on leaders via social media and otherwise. So today we'll be exploring uh, a number of questions. What makes a good leader, right? Uh, are you a born leader or can you learn how to be a good leader? How has leadership changed in this era of technological disruption? And do leaders need to be equipped with a new set of skills to maneuver through this new world? Well, I think many of you are familiar with exactly who's on stage with me here, but uh, I'll introduce them again if you haven't had a chance to check your conference agenda. And I hope all of you have downloaded the Milken app as well, because I'll be going back to that at the end of the session to get some live polls from each of you. So, first off, we have Marina Mahatir, writer and activist. And of course, if her last name looks familiar, well, it is. Her 93-year-old father's just been re-elected as the Prime Minister of Malaysia, so you know she comes from a really formidable family. Of course, we've got Michael Owen, uh, no introduction there, FIFA Ballon d'Or winner, former Liverpool, Real Madrid, Manchester United, England player, so fans of the beautiful game amongst you, you'll all get some insight on how to lead on the field and off. We have Igor Tulchinsky, the founder, chairman, and CEO of WorldQuaint, uh, who, amongst many of WorldQuaint's many activities, uh, has set up institutions that use data, that crunch financial numbers to come up with predictions, not just in the financial world, but also in the field of medical science. And finally, my friend, John Wood, founder of Room to Read. Full disclosure, I'm an avid supporter of his charity. So, my first question to all of you, and it's going to be a really hard question because uh, you all have to answer it in under three minutes. And uh, essentially, as leaders in your own field, tell us, what makes you tick? Who wants to have a go? <laughs> under three minutes. Okay. Go on, go on. Sure, I'll start. Uh, you know, leadership uh, has uh, been uh, evolving. Uh, I've been uh, with my company now uh, in one way or another for, for 24 years, and I've seen uh, it change. And uh, it's becoming, uh, leadership, leadership is becoming more and more a multidisciplinary thing. Uh, it, you know, while in 24 years ago, you could just uh, concentrate on your own domain. Today, uh, with a preponderance of uh, data and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the increasing role of prediction, the leader has to understand many different things. He has to fuse everything together and uh, provide uh, many things to the company, such as uh, energy, mm -hmm. such as uh, producing future leaders. So the role of the leadership is uh, changing, and I, uh, I think I'll I'm running out of my three minutes here, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, that's right. I'll try to emulate you, and I'll do it in <laughs> two minutes, and then we can, get, we, can all, we can all give a couple minutes back. Um, what makes me tick? Um, so I'm passionate about education. Um, I'm two generations removed from poverty. My grandfather had a fourth grade education, and it was education that propelled my family in the middle, cl in the middle class in small town America, where I had access to good public schools, a public library, and a Carnegie era library. And books made my life as a young man. I eventually got to Microsoft and did um, semi well there. Um, and then quit to start the organization Room to Read. We have many supporters um, uh, here in the room today. I see a lot of familiar faces. What makes me tick <clears throat> is that I'm annoyed by the fact that we live in a world that has what I call the lottery of life. Um, the reality is that our life as a young person is the two biggest determinants of what our life's like as a young person are where we are born and to whom we are born. And if you're born to wealthy parents or educated parents in a good school district, you have access to good education. If you're born poor, if you're born to illiterate parents, if you're born to poor parents in a developing world country, especially in a rural area, um, you have these, all these strikes against you. So if you think about this, education is the most important thing in the world, yet it is completely randomized. Because you, as a one-year-old or two-year-old, don't get to choose where you're born or to whom you are born. So at Room to Read, our goal is very simple. It's to unrandomize it. It's to say that every single child, whether they're in rural Bangladesh or the deserts of Rajasthan or rural Tanzania or post-Civil War Sri Lanka, we can say to every single child, we're going to reach you from a young age with literacy, we're going to reach you with the library, trained teachers, habit of reading, and for God's sake, we're not going to leave the girls and young women behind because two-thirds of those who are out of school um, today are girls and young women. And if we don't solve that problem, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't solve other problems. So uh, I'm a committed feminist uh, as a child of educated, an educated mother. Um, but I'm also, of course, not anti-boy, as a former boy myself. I believe <laughs> every boy should have education, every girl should have education, I'm very proud. What keeps me ticking is not the 16 million children we've reached already, which I'm very proud of. What keeps me ticking is that there's tens of millions of kids who have never heard of Room to Read, and until they have heard of Room to Read, then the job's not done and we can't be sanctimonious or self-satisfied. We've got to stay in GSD, get stuff done mode, or get shit done mode, if you want to call it that and just every day I wake up hungry and ready to do everything in my power to reach more kids in more places. If we get to them, their lives are changed forever. If we don't get to them, then it's simply a lost opportunity. Thank you, John. Now I turn to this <coughs> side. What makes you tick in under three minutes? Um, well, for me, I, I never thought of myself as a leader. Um, I certainly wasn't a, a leader in training by parents. Uh, but I, in my early working life, I was gathering, in hindsight, I was gathering a lot of skills that helped me a lot. I was, uh, in, I was a writer, journalist, I was in PR, I was organizing events, I was doing fundraising. And that's how uh, eventually, uh, about 20 years ago, I was uh, asked to head a, the Malaysian AIDS Foundation. And I was really plunged into the deep end. I had never worked with a lot of the groups uh, that were working in HIV. I only knew fundraising, but in the 12 years that I led the organization, it was very big. Uh, we were very successful fundraisers for AIDS, uh, AIDS programs in uh, Malaysia, but we also uh, managed to advocate for free treatment for Malaysians with HIV, for mother-to-child uh, transmission programs, for harm harm reduction needle exchange programs for drug users and everything. And um, I realized really that in that time, I was lucky in that HIV chose me uh, to lead it because it suited me perfectly because I have a very short attention span. Uh, but with HIV, you get to talk about not just health and medical issues, but you talk, get to talk about economics, about politics, about law, about human rights, about religion, um, and just about everything, because everything um, is related. So that's, I, I think that's how I developed my skills along the way, and, and, and that's why uh, people consider me that. And since then, I've, I've gone on to do more uh, human rights work, but particularly in gender rights and doing it in different ways. I've produced TV programs, I've produced films, and I'm currently, uh, I've founded a travel website for women, which is what I call a, a sideways way of empowering women. Thank you. 
Michael. Well, I too didn't think um, I was a leader growing up. Um, of course, I was part of a team sport, so we always looked at our coach as the, as the leader. Um, of course, the older you get, the more and more responsibility, responsibility you take within that team. Um, I played under some of the best leaders of, of recent generations, um, the likes of Sir Alex Ferguson. And I think later on in my career, um, becoming captain for various teams, including the England national team, you almost take on that responsibility and, and learn on the job. Um, and now, having been retired for about five years, I think it's interesting to look at other leaders in, in my field. Um, I've then gone on to a variety of different businesses um, and employ quite a lot of people now. So I think the leadership thing has, has almost um, grown with me and I, I actually quite enjoy what I've learned um, for many, many years, as I say, working under the, some of the best leaders in my sport. Wow. Well, thank you, all of you. And you all kept it to uh, about three minutes or under, so <laughs> much appreciated. Uh, now, talk us through examples of, uh, of challenges, uh, you know, in your roles as leaders. You've talked a bit about it, but, you know, what made you sort of understand what leadership was? And was there one particular episode uh, which defined leadership for you? Um, we'll all want to get a sense of your sort of personal, you know, anecdotes and a sense of what you've gone through to get you to the stage today. Should I go? Okay. Yeah, we're not eager. You're really brave, the first one to go each time. So, uh, in 2007, there was a quant meltdown. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but uh, all the quantitative funds started uh, bleeding together and uh, losing money. And we also went through that and suffered uh, through that and uh, came out uh, fine. We made uh, a lot of... Uh, sharp moves, uh, getting out of the market, getting, getting in the market. And that was a very uh, trying time for me as, as, as a leader because I had to make decisions at the same time, make uh, correct decisions, so kind of form visions about the future. I had to uh, make sure that everybody else bought it into the vision. I had to keep everybody calm and I had to infuse the energy into the organization to keep uh, the whole thing going. So uh, that's uh, one, one example of something that happened in, in, in our business, things like that yeah. happen. Of course, yeah. Anyone else? Well, I, I come from the NGO field, and the NGO field is a bit different from most other places because we are so um, politically correct in a way that we're always uh, going on about uh, consensus and equality, and, and sometimes that can lead to uh, paralysis, really, because everyone has a say, everyone's uh, opinion has to be respected and all that. So the challenge for me was really to take in all these different opinions and respect them and still make a decision. And I, I realized that it's quite difficult but I had to always come in with a firm uh, idea, opinion on my, uh, myself on any particular issue, and at the end of it, decide, but without making anyone feel like they've been you know, pushed aside or anything. So that I find is, is um, particular in the NGO field. It's a very difficult thing to navigate because we are always advocating for accountability and transparency and all that, not always uh, practicing it ourselves. So trying to um, get those values, uh, you know, part of our work and, and carrying on and showing it uh, to the outside world, to society, was uh, a real challenge. But Again, you know, um, at least in Malaysia, if you set the example from the top, people will usually follow, and, and that's how it works, yeah. Great, thank you. Michael. Well, in my profession, it was um, very much a, a development stage, I think. I was playing in a high-stakes game um, right from the age of 17 when I first made my debut for Liverpool, and, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but you follow your leaders in, in many respects. And it was only later on in my 
career. Um, I had since then moved to Real Madrid and still felt as if I was being led by lots of other people within the team and, of course, on the man management level. But I think it was only when I made my next move um, to Newcastle United and I was made captain that I felt as if then I had a role to help others as well, um, the way I had been helped. And again, following that, moving to, to Manchester United, being led by probably one of the greatest leaders of, of all time, certainly in the sporting field, in Sir Alex Ferguson. It was at that point of my life that I was looking to the future, almost looking for tips on how he did it, how he managed different people. Um, and being a senior player myself, helping again um, with, the, with the next generation, with the younger players in the team. So I think, I mean, I was retired at 33 and I almost think I still got so much more to, to learn. Um, but in that short period of time, especially in my late 20s, early 30s, when I was being managed by Sir Alex Ferguson, I learned an awful lot about leading and I would have, part of me would have loved to stay in the, in the game and, and put some of those lessons to good use, but I've used them in, in, in a different um, way now in, in some of my other businesses. Thank you. John? I, w I would say for me, probably my biggest challenge was <clears throat> being in an environment like Microsoft, where I had, a, I had a title. I was Director of Business Development for Greater China, covering mainland Taiwan, Hong Kong. And at the time, in 98, 99, Microsoft was doing very, very well. And um, I was used to getting my calls returned. I was used to having people, if I wanted to meet with somebody, I would meet, they would meet with me. If I wanted to email them, if I emailed them, they would email me back. And then <clears throat> when I left Microsoft to start Room to Read, I'd say I, I had an instant loss of status because nobody could really define what I did. Um, I was, you know, going from having a fancy title. And people, if, you're at, if you're at a dinner party, it's the first thing people ask you. What do you do? And I was, I deliver books in the back of yaks to rural Himalayan villages. And people were like, that's, that's really interesting, dude. And then they would like disappear, be standing, <laughs> standing at the chip dip totally by myself. And I remember running into, the, running into a former, a guy who used to work for me at Microsoft Australia when I ran marketing there in a Singapore airport. And we did that thing where you're on the escalators and you're going by each other and we, hey, hey, hey. And I was asking him what he was up to and he gave me a 15 minute download about how wonderful his career was uh, and how much he was achieving. And at the end of it, he's like, are you still doing that thing with books in the Himalayas? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, good for you, mate. And he kind of disappeared. And so I had to learn not to take it personally. Um, I, and I think resilience is key to success of leaders. Uh, when something goes wrong, you can't freak out. You can't get upset. My wife always says, float above the chessboard. Just look down on the chessboard and, and, and get your next, your next moves ready. Um, and I definitely learned a lot about sales. Uh, when someone said, no, I'm not going to invest in your little education NGO, I didn't hear the word no. I added a T and a Y-E-T to it. And I said, I just heard not yet. And I caught off, and people are fans of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? ABC, always be closing. I was just in this ABC mode of like, look, I'm just going to get myself on a plane and travel the world and tell people that for 300 US dollars, a girl can go to school for a year and have her life change forever. That to me is the biggest no brainer in the history of philanthropy. And then thankfully, one day, Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia Capital, said to me, That's the biggest no brainer in the history of philanthropy. And he wrote a really, really big check and started making introductions. So I learned, I think, be resilient. Um, don't be afraid to ask for the order. The worst salesperson in the order is a person who cowers in the corner and doesn't ask for the order. I get out there, and any of you in this room who know me, many of you in this room have been on the receiving end of me asking you for the order. You got to be completely just almost like just madly in love with fundraising. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be a little NGO that has a very small budget and you've got a big heart, but I always say no money equals no mission. So I think I learned to be resilient, float above the chessboard, don't freak out when things go wrong, turn no into not yet, and for God's sake, be in ABC mode, always be closing. Yeah, yeah, and you wrote about that in your book, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, uh, which I've read, and I'm sure many other Room to Read supporters have read. And you talked about that spiritual journey you went through going to a Nepalese village and how it basically changed your perspective on the world, didn't it? It's just a, yeah, well, I, yeah. I went to Nepal originally in 1998 to do the Annapurna circuit because there was a rumor that if you went high enough in the Himalayas, you could escape the sound of Steve Ballmer yelling at you. And <laughs> I wanted to try that out, and it did... It, it, it did indeed work, um, but rather than having Bomber yelling at me, I had a headmaster asking me for books for his library, and I remember this headmaster, I said, why don't, well, you have 400 kids in your, little, in your school, why do you not have books? 
And he said, well, in Nepal, rural Nepal, I know Benod's here, um, in rural Nepal, he said, we are too poor to afford education, but until we get educated, we're always going to remain poor. And that struck me as a topic sentence of poverty. Why do two billion people live on less than $2 a day? Why do a billion people live on a dollar a day? It's not because they're dumb. We're all born with the same gray matter. It's not because they're lazy. Just surviving in their environments, post-war Sri Lanka, post-apartheid South Africa, takes a lot of resilience. They're born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think that every entrepreneurial journey starts when someone says, this can't be a hard problem to figure out. I said that. It turns out it was a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, but you get, you got to start somewhere. And I believe that you were saying about the NGO world. I guess for me, my big thing about the NGO world is there's too many people talking about problems and not enough people acting on solutions. And until we're acting on the solution, it's just there's a lot of, there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. So I think for our entire team, we're just very action-oriented by the numbers, data-driven, and we just got to make those numbers go higher and higher and higher. Okay, As great. Steve Ballmer used to say, go big or go home. Thank you. Now, I'm sure everyone can, can listen to you, uh, you know, going on how, about how wonderful it is. But, of course, we, you know, it's interesting that you all seem incredibly humble uh, from what you've been saying, but, you know, you've all done incredible things. Marina, you say you're not a leader, and yet, you know, you're an activist and a writer, and you've often written about very controversial things in a very conservative society about the rights of women and gay rights as well. I mean, you once compared uh, the, the plight of women in Malaysia to, to being equivalent to, to, to being, you know, um, African in, in South, South Africa during the apartheid era. So, so tell us, you know, you all need a great level of confidence and guts in what you do to go ahead and sort of manage uh, the kind of environments you live in. Well, I think for me, I've been kind of lucky because I live in Malaysia. And Malaysians, on the whole, love to talk, love to scream, but they won't actually do anything. <laughs> so uh, I've never, although it can be annoying. They uh, did something. They all went out to vote in May, didn't they? Oh, they did, yes. I, I mean, positive <laughs> things. They, were, But I mean, they can scream and yell at you, but face to face, they'll, they'll all like, you know, they, they, they won't touch you. They won't throw bombs at you or, or anything like that. So for that, I'm very grateful. Uh, <laughs> And that helps a lot. Um, but, you know, um, it, it's just one of those things. I mean, it, I feel strongly about these issues. And that, I think, is what powers me. Um, working in HIV, I, I had to work with sex workers, drug users, uh, LGBT, refugees, everything, migrant workers and everything. And, and, you know, from being a very sheltered, very establishment type person being plunged into uh, groups like this and really learning about their problems, um, I realized that I had a voice that I could use and, and I, I felt responsible that like I could do something, do a little bit of something. Um, the only issue about that is that I, my goal in life is really to empower people to speak for themselves. Um, in Malaysia, at least, we have a tendency to be kind of dependent on leaders. And like, oh, Marina, you have to talk about this, 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 this. And otherwise, you know, if I don't talk about it, then nothing happens, apparently. And, and I think that's the wrong attitude. That's, you know, I really want to nurture and encourage uh, leaders from the grassroots to do it uh, themselves, because I think that's the only way that change will really happen. Otherwise, I mean, what if I get run over by a truck tomorrow or something, you know, hopefully not, but um, then, then what happens? So I think it is our responsibility as leaders to make sure there is a pipeline of uh, people coming along to, to continue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's getting, I'm getting this great insight about all of you and, and, and what sort of makes you tick. I mean, you all told us at the start what makes you tick, but I think what it takes is guts, isn't it? I mean, would you say that you were just sort of born with this uh, innate ability to be confident in your abilities, or was this something that was learned? And uh, I want to get a sense of, you know, obviously, um, you know, Michael, one of the top scorers for England of all time, you know, and, and being named by Pele in the FIFA list of uh, the best living uh, footballers. And, uh, you know, Igor, doing what you did as well, coming up with a, a firm that comes up with quantitative analysis, uh, not just for finance, but then applying it to things like 
medical science and outcomes. I mean, you're all doing these incredible things. And of course, John, we know you do an incredible thing that I, I wholeheartedly support as well. So, you know, what, what really enables you to do that? Is it guts? Is it passion? What is it? I think it's just sheer determination because uh, no matter what abilities you're born with, if you do something a thousand times, you'll get pretty good at it. <laughs> so it's your ability to uh, keep going in the face of adversity and, and to have a vision and to follow it uh, no matter what that will determine uh, your success. Okay. And that's it? That seems really simple. That's simple. <laughs> okay. I think that then feeds confidence. Right. Once you have this attitude, um, I think it then feeds confidence, it feeds self-belief. Um, as has been mentioned, you get put in a situation so many times, in my case, kicking a ball in the back of the net, but there's lots of different angles, lots of different circumstances, how you do it, you know, why you do it, what power you hit it with, what angle you hit it on. The more and more you do that, the more and more you realize you know, I'm more successful doing it this way. But that then feeds a, a confidence, a self-belief, of which I think there's a, a big difference. I think there's a self-belief where your performance rarely lowers beneath 80, 85%. Um, and the confidence in my game was where the magic happens. So, you know, if I'm just on a normal day, I'd be scoring one goal. And if I'm on a real confident day, I might be scoring two or three. But that practice, that sheer um, determination, that gets you to a level, I think, that then enables you to think, hang on a minute, I'm quite good at this, and then that's where you start breeding a lot more confidence in yourself. Right, yeah. So a, a lot of it's psychology, um, how you feel. I, w I would add on, I think, that leaders are incredibly inclusive in terms of inviting people in and making people feel like we all want to be part of a winning team, right? Nobody wants to be part of a losing team. And I think that when I hear leaders speak, I often listen to whether they're saying I or we, right? And the leader who says, I did this. I, if you look at a business magazine, the cover, it's, it's, like, it's like they talk about, they profile a CEO, and it's like, she's done this, and she's, and it's kind of like, not all by herself. Like, she's, she's the leader of the team. And when I started Room to Read, I said, my goal is not to be the leader of an organization. I want to be one of many, many, many leaders of a global movement. And that sounds grandiose, but I've invited thousands of business executives to get involved and to say, we're not a big, rich foundation. Therefore, we need to invite people in to get involved. I think you have to give them the honor of recognizing them. So we have a thing at Room to Read. We have a principle that whenever we win an award, the person who accepts that award, whether it be me or our CEO, whoever it be, accepts the award on behalf of the 1,600 employees and on behalf of the 10,000 employees of Room to Read and recognize that. And I think that... Being a great leader means you need to be very egoless. You need to admit when you screw something up and take ownership of it. And we all screw things up. And the difference between a great leader and a mediocre leader is that a mediocre leader sweeps it under the carpet and pretends it didn't happen. The great leader addresses it and says, hey, I'm really sorry. I screwed up. This is on me. Um, and that, I think, creates a, a good sense of trust. I think it also just creates a sense that people are on a winning team. And we all know that people who are on a winning team attract other winners. Whereas if your team's mediocre and you're getting you know, the whole A, tra a players attract A players, B players attract C players, yeah, I think you've got to keep your eyes open for as many A players as you can recruit. But the way you're going to do it, I think, is by being um, egoless and by making the team feel like every single victory is a team victory. Yeah. No, I just want to pick up on that, John. You mentioned this thing about, you know, obviously, being a great leader, uh, you know, essentially you'd have to take responsibility for things going wrong um, and you know ego interesting you mentioned about that as well um, you know and, and in this age of uh, social media and otherwise you know there's this level of accountability this level of scrutiny on leaders now that makes your jobs and uh, many of the leaders in the audience your jobs incredibly challenging uh, because of that level of scrutiny so so what do you think leaders of the future require or what, what are they going to need to be able to manage that kind of scrutiny uh, that you have on social media with you know, campaigns and movements like Me Too and, and otherwise? What's the, um, you know, the crucial thick, thing? Thick skin. <laughs> thick skin. <laughs> yeah, thick skin. <laughs> um, you know, the scrutiny, at least in my experience on social media, and I'm on social media quite a bit, there's good scrutiny that they're you know, trying to keep you honest, trying to keep you accountable, 
um, trying to engage with you on real policy issues and real substantive issues. Then there's the other type of scrutiny, which is basically just criticism and a lot of it not constructive at all. I mean, it might be particular to my field that I'm working in women's rights, particularly Muslim women's rights. And just the very sight of a woman talking about the issues that I'm talking about, about justice in the family, about laws and policies that need to be uh, ensuring justice and fairness and equality for women, um, just makes some people just totally crazy. And uh, you know, they, they just go on at you, not on the substantive issues, but on the way you look, and the way you behave, and, and all sorts of things. So there's social media, uh, unfortunately, has also brought on that type of scrutiny. And, and the challenge for, for women leaders, particularly, is to really you know, know how to separate the, the, the good from the bad. And you really need to develop a thick skin to, to like ignore the, the rubbish out there and really deal uh, with the more substantive issues. But it can be, you know, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not lying, it can be dispiriting. Mm. Um, and I don't think, like we've been talking in Malaysia, we've really been talking about this type of online abuse. And even talking to some people in the new government, which is supposed to be more open and everything, because there's so many guys in there, they don't get it. Mm. They really don't get it. Um, it's, it's a big challenge for us to, to try and say that, you know, we get death threats. We get our names and addresses and ICs and everything published online. And sometimes even encur uh, people encouraging um, uh, others to do things to us, uh, sermons <laughs> in the mosque telling people to go do something about those, those women. Um, these things need to be taken seriously. Um, and um, it's, it's, we're not getting quite the support yet, but hopefully uh, with this new environment in Malaysia, we will now. Yeah, wow, that's hugely challenging. I mean, how, how, does, how do you all deal with it? Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't fear transparency, and I don't think we should fear transparency. I think we should celebrate transparency. Uh, Warren Buffett had that famous thing when he said, if you ever face a moral quandary and you're moving in a certain direction that you feel might be dubious, ask yourself, how would you feel if tomorrow morning your decision appeared on the front page of the New York Times? That was the Warren Buffett test. Well, today you don't have to wait until the next morning's New York Times. What is going on is going to be on social media very quickly. Um, and we're moving to a world where everything is transparent, and probably none of us can stop it. So then the question is, okay, if you can't stop it, well then, can you use that to your advantage, right? Because if everything's gonna be transparent, then life becomes really simple. Uh, don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't use your position of power to take advantage of other people. Um, and assume what you do is on the record. Now, if something you, you or one of your employees does is they do something wrong and it goes in the record, then you have to quickly address it and quickly apologize to, for it. And you don't take four days or five days or six days, hunker down with your PR firms. You get out in front of it, and you own it. But I think transparency, for the most part, for any of us as leaders, um, if you look at 1MDB, like the, uh, things, were not, things were not right. Um, if you look at Greg Mortensen, the, the guy who wrote Three Cups of Tea, something was not right with that organization. And eventually, John Krakauer in 60 Minutes figured out and took him down. So we live in an era where I think there's everything is, if everything is going to be transparent, everything is going to be revealed, then that makes life really simple. Don't ask yourself, is this a transaction I'm doing in the shadows? Is this a transaction I'm doing in the light? Everything you're doing basically is going to be in the light, and that makes our job as leaders, I think, um, more important, but also makes it easier, because you don't have to send, spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not what you do will eventually be public knowledge. Yeah, yeah good point. But do you find that you're constantly watching your backs now as a result? There's this whole sense of scrutiny from everywhere, essentially. Well, you don't have to watch your back if you're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. 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 I, I don't, I'm a simple guy. I just say, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to worry about it. If someone wants to t take my photo and post it on Twitter of what I'm doing tonight or last night or whatever, then I don't know. Like, I was doing nothing wrong, so why should I, why should I fear that? Yeah. In our case, we maintain pretty much complete transparency. You know, I don't believe in doing anything based on secrets. And once you maintain the transparency, uh, 
you know, you, you'll get some good things, some bad things. There's, they're just part of life. Mm. Yeah. Well, but, you know, again, if you're a public figure, I mean, Michael, I'm thinking of you, uh, Marina, to some extent, you talked about it as well. I mean, there's all this scrutiny. I mean, you've probably got, like, the Daily Mail outside your door mm. all the time, or at least at the height of, of your fame. So, you know, how do you deal with that? It's this constant battle of trying to say, you know, do not uh, invade my privacy, and yet also then being a, an example to so many people around the world. It is a hard balance, and Maureen, I was, I was really interested to, to hear what she was saying, because in my sport, there's very similar. There's, there's death threats. If I wear blue and you wear red, then half the population hates you and love me, and vice versa, and that's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's very wrong. We're playing a game here. We're playing a game, um, a popular game that, that should be enjoyed around the world, but it's uh, tempers can, can fray in, in our sport and have done for a long time. So even though now social media is out there and you know, we can read firsthand what our fans think, we've been under the scrutiny from, as you say, newspapers for, for many, many years. I arrived back from the World Cup in 1998 um, as a little known young footballer, as an 18 year old, and performed as such in a World Cup that as soon as I turned home, there was probably about 30 um, cameramen, about 20 television crews, um, dozens and dozens of, of other people. And I don't think that subsided for probably about two months. I was literally followed around by a convoy of 60 people for a couple of months just because I scored a, a goal in a World Cup. Now, you know, that's all right for, for some, but when you've never experienced anything like that as a, as, a, as a young boy, then it was quite scary, quite daunting. And then, of course, any move you make after that, it's scrutinised. If I walk into a, you know, into a certain shop or into a, whatever I do, it's, you know, the, the big debate is, is on. Mm. And it just takes over your life in a way. So it, it's been out in the public eye for, for a number of years um, now social media has, has probably intensified it a little bit more, but if I'm honest, myself and other footballers alike have been living this life in the, in the public eye for, for a long time now. Yeah, yeah, so it's tough. You all have really tough roles and you know, things to do there. Um, now we're gonna talk about, and I realize we've got about 25 minutes on the clock, and I do wanna open it up to the audience. You all have been amazingly uh, you know, wrapped in attention, and I'm sure you've all got great questions as well. But, uh, I mean, let's talk about the future, and I know we, we haven't talked about technology quite so much, and I know technology is this great disruptor. Uh, you know, with the way people are being socialized these days, digitally, on apps, let's face it, we're all socializing a lot more via apps, aren't we? WhatsApp and God knows what else out there. People have become accustomed to this new digital age. Perhaps it's not so much, you know, one-on-one, -on -one or, you know, it's, it's, it's a different kind of socialization. So what will the the future of leadership be like? Can you actually lead via an app or Twitter, for example? I mean, it, it, will, will the next generation of leadership look so vastly different from what we have now? Or do you think it'll stay more or less the same? I think, Igor, you're the technology guy. You tell us. Sure, yeah. Well, things are changing. And uh, already uh, in, in our case, we do have an online app that uh, people uh, interact with, uh, with us through, and uh, we are able to reach huge, huge, uh, you know, populations in all kinds of countries all over the world through that medium, and uh, we organize contests around it. So uh, it's it's a very efficient way to reach uh, talent all around the world and to uh, provide uh, opportunity to all this talent to equalize things, as you were saying earlier, so uh, yeah, the world is definitely changing in the, mm. this direction. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what's interesting about World Quant is you, you are able to take the, the data that's out there, crunch the numbers, and come up with predictions. So if you were to come up with a prediction and you, you crunch the numbers about what would make a good leader, what would it be? If you were to make a prediction about yeah. what would Can make you? a good leader. Can we use World Quant technology to discover what a good leader is? We can, but we need uh, 
lots of data first. <laughs> Great. Well, hopefully we're all getting some data now with all of your various apps out there. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want I to would, pick up on this? I, I would add to it. I mean, I think uh, I'm going to sway from the technology thing a little bit. We, we tended these conferences to talk tech, 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 till we're blue in the face talking about technology. Um, so I'm just going to take the, your question about how does leadership evolve. Um, number one is I think it needs to be so much more inclusive um, in terms of your leadership teams and where they come from and what they look like. Um, and that needs to be measured. Every, I think every leader, every board's got to just have KPIs around that, not just KPIs, but just have specific actions. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a founding CEO of now one of the largest, most impactful education organizations in the world, but I turned the position over to our second generation CEO, who is a woman, who turned it over to the third generation CEO, Gita Morali, who's a woman. So I can proudly say I'm a founder who has had both my successor CEOs as women. Um, that doesn't happen often enough. We know that. We know that when most female CEOs retire, they're almost inevitably it doesn't go from a woman to a woman, and that needs to change. Um, I think the way that workforces are recruited, I mean, room to read, we have one of the most diverse workforces in the world. 90% um, of our employees are at the uh, coal face, out of the operations. They're Nepalese and Nepal, and Tanzanians in Tanzania, and Rwandans in Rwanda. So we have an incredibly diverse workforce as a result of that. 90% of our workforce was born and raised in a low-income country. So that's interesting as a challenge, as great as an opportunity, and I'll tell you, when you tell them, you guys are in charge, we're not gonna send a bunch of white guys and Land Rovers to your country to boss you around, you're empowered to make every single decision here in your country, uh, that empowers them. And I think third, we all need to do a better job of uh, recruiting, promoting, and empowering women to be the leaders of the organization. I'll repeat a stat I gave last year at Milken that I'm very, very proud of. 54% um, of our employees worldwide are women. 56% of our managers are women. Uh, our third generation CEO, as mentioned, is a woman. But we don't stop there. Six of her seven direct reports are women. And I think we I need tell to applaud that. What do you think? I tell a, well, I, <laughs> yeah. I tell a joke that, I tell a joke that um, like many of my jokes, is not that funny. But my joke is that a lot of companies have women in leadership conferences, and a lot of companies have women in leadership initiatives. At Room to Read, we simply have done something radically different. We simply have women in leadership, full stop. Great. And, and Marina, I'm going to have to turn to you now, because uh, women in leadership positions, it's really tough in Asia, isn't it? And, and you've probably got a, a first-hand experience with this. Yes, like, well, particularly in the field that um, I'm in, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, people still uh, find it, uh, the idea of a woman in a leadership position is still difficult. Uh, for, for some people, unless she is playing to a man's tune. But I, talking about technology and leadership, actually what I wanted to say and give the example is actually Malaysia, Malaysia's G14, the general election that we just had this year. Because the campaign was totally a WhatsApp campaign. Hmm. It was completely, because we had no access to mainstream media, um, no, it just couldn't reach uh, at all. We weren't on TV, we weren't on nothing. So everyone was passing on all the campaign materials on WhatsApp. And every single rally was on FB Live. And that totally made a difference because, and the thing is, I, I think it has to be a combination of face-to-face -face plus technology because the big rallies, the big Pakatan Harapan rallies, had about 80,000 people, 100,000 people. But watching on FB Live was 250,000 people. And the reach was just so amazing. And that's really uh, what brought people out. They, they, everyone could see every single rally, which was not possible before. None of it was uh, reported in the mainstream media, and yet, People knew what the issues were, people knew what the manifesto was, people knew who are the personalities, and they wanted to see uh, the personalities. I campaigned, I did 15 speeches in 10 days, and I was going to small towns, um, speaking of the back of trucks, and um, also doing house-to-house -house campaigning. But everything was FB Live from a little mobile phone. And, and that went just everywhere. So it, I think, you know, at, at least I can only speak for Malaysia, mm -hmm. 
where people really still want to see a live human person come and speak to them because it's a show that you care about, about them. But at the same time, they also appreciate the fact that they can watch everything on, online. Yeah, so it's really transformed. Yeah, it's well. completely, completely An different. Incredible thing, isn't it? Now, uh, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, I thought I might, at this stage, start to open it up to the audience. I see, I believe there are microphones around, so we, uh, we want to keep the questions fairly short. You can tell us where you're from, and, um, and you can uh, specify who you'd like to ask the question to. So, ah, gentleman right in the back. My name is Michael. I have a question for Michael. Uh, World Cup football, penalty shootouts. Uh, England know a little bit about that. So does the leader take the first penalty or does he delegate? Oh. <laughs> Good question. Normally the best penalty taker takes the first penalty. Um, why that is, I'm not 100% sure. I think a lot of the time, if you win the toss as a, in, in, the, in the penalty shootout, you elect to go first and you put your best penalty taker first. So it's difficult because we're obvi we, I obviously am part of a team sport, but you still need a lot of leaders within that team. The most successful teams are the ones with, with the most leaders. And as you rightly pointed out, I've been involved in a few penalty shootouts myself and... It's, um, it's not a nice feeling. It's not nice having the weight of the, well, certainly your country on your shoulders. However, at some point, any leader will have to, you know, dig in. They'll have to do something they don't particularly enjoy doing. Um, and that's in my case. You know, some people will say, oh, I love taking a penalty. But, you know, sometimes you will be... I know that a few of the lads that, that were taking penalties were slightly concerned that if they missed, what would happen? We've all seen, in, or lots of people, I can enlighten you that in England, if you miss a penalty, then you're very famous for the rest of your life for the wrong <laughs> reasons. There will be adverts, you know, adverts made of you, that everybody will be poking fun of you, and that's just the, the funny side. There will be other not-so-nice things. So... You know, you, you're keen to avoid being the one, let's say, to, to blame. But I think it does take a lot of courage and you need to be a leader to be able to stand up and, and take a penalty. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Over there, this lady. There's no one here. She's got a microphone. Ah, yes, hello. thank you. It's my old friend, Sharon G. Hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> hello, um, Manisha. I think it is Manisha, it isn't is it? Manisha. Yes, my ex-colleague. Um, yeah, I'm from CNN on the opposition. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> Um, actually, my question was also for Michael, um, but I'd like to be a little bit selfish and ask two questions. So, Michael, my question for you is related to the recent World Cup. And I was so lucky to be in England when I was watching all the matches. And, of course, as you know, a huge, a big deal was made about Gareth Southgate's waistcoat. <laughs> but that is representative of the fact that people really focused on him, actually, as much as the team and I wondered what you made of his leadership skills um, and the impact that it had on the population that were watching this and the number of young kids, for example, who were really inspired when they watched the World Club play out. Um, so that's my first question. And the second question is to you, John. Um, and this is about leadership in schools and getting in at a very young age and teaching kids about good leadership. You know, they say that sexism is taught Racism is taught. Kids don't, they're not born that way. Um, and so I was really interested here from your perspective about the importance of um, kids being ingrained with this kind of education at the room to read stage. So those are my two questions, thank you. Or we could just, you could answer my question, I could answer yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Who wants to go first? Michael does. Michael. Okay, so this, uh, this World Cup was fabulous from England's point of view. Um, we had a great manager, a great leader. I played alongside Gareth um, in various England squads. And I think there was a real connection between himself, our team, and the, well, the rest of the world, but certainly our nation. I think it's the first time in a long time that, that we felt that connection. Um, and I think part of it is because we've gone into this World Cup probably with a lesser 
amount of talent, let's say, than we've had in the, few, in the, in the past. There was a lower expectation. Um, but I just think that the whole feeling uh, amongst it is, uh, was, was a great one. Um, we exceeded expectations. I know people will say we got lucky with, with the passage that we got through and the draw, and every time we played a, a very strong team, we, we, uh, we got beat. Obviously, once um, by Belgium in the, in the group stage and then at the semi-final stage as well against Croatia. So, of course, there's lots to build on and, of course, we're not the finished article. Far from it. However, I thought it was a huge step in the right direction for, for our national team. English football, our Premier League, is, is a world leader. We're, we're very lucky to have a, a great league. However, that's almost cost us in the, in the past. We get all the great players from all over the world, all different nationalities... And then we have obviously a very small pool of English footballers to, to play now because the standard is so high. Consequently, we have a small pool of players then to pick from from the national team, for the national team. So as much as the Premier League is great, it's hindered our national team for many years now. But I think there's signs that we're getting a lot better and certainly the feel-good factor is back from, from uh, in English football again. Yeah. And John, do you want to pick up the question on education? The non-football question, yes. Um, <laughs> um, so to your question, I would say there's several things we're trying to do to make sure that we're inculcating really good values in kids from a young age. I mean, to be clear, we didn't start out as a values base. Especially, you've you got to be very careful if you come from outside a country going and saying we're going to teach values. So the most important thing is all of our employees are local national. So it's not us bringing in values from outside the country. It's the Sri Lankan team deciding what the Sri Lankan books look like. An important thing for us is in 2004, with the support of Jeff Skoll, the founding president of eBay, we became a publisher uh, of children's literature. And the reason we had to do that was because the for-profit publishers don't publish books in languages spoken by poor people. Right? Why would you? There's no profit margin. The for-profit publishers publish in English, um, German, French, Japanese, et cetera. They don't publish in Laos, Sinhalese, Tamil, Nepalese, et cetera, because there's no market. But we realized early on that kids need books in their mother tongue because if you don't learn the language spoken in the home in school, then you have no basis for literacy. So we became a publisher in Nepal. Our first um, 10 titles were in Nepalese. Um, our goal was to have original content because the most expeditious thing would have been to bring outside content in and just translate it. But then you got a kid in Cambodia reading Pippi Longstocking or Heidi, and they have no cultural reference to that. We want kids to see kids who look like themselves, right? One of the big the Hector Peterson uh, incident in South Africa happened because a lot of black South Africans were being told that their kids were going to learn Afrikaans and they were not going to learn their own language. Well, I'm very proud when we went into South Africa, we began publishing in all, all 11 official languages of South Africa. So that every kid, whether they spoke Zulu or Setswana, would see kids who looked like them and be able to speak the language in the home. Some of that, I think, also comes with the opportunity to reinforce certain values. So we take a look with each of our books uh, we look at it through a gender lens. That's a fancy way of saying, make sure your books don't reinforce negative stereotypes. So in our books in Cambodia, it had a uh, scene where the boys were outside after dinner playing football, um, football reference, and the girls were inside cleaning the house and washing the dishes. And our Cambodia team said, no, 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 you can't do that. The boys and the girls will do the dishes together, and then the boys and the girls will go outside and play football together. It sounds simple, but we were at once, there's a famous story about being in a meeting with the uh, Cambodian Ministry of Education, and there's a story about a girl who wanted to be a truck driver. And one of the ministry officials said, girls don't want to be truck drivers. And our team said, how do you know that? Like, you, you're just going to make that defect. And thankfully, we got the decision reversed, and the girl did get to do that. But I think it's really important. We've now done 1,600 original titles. Uh, we've published in 33 languages. Uh, we are going now in the refugee-heavy areas. So, and we launched in Jordan last year with the support of Sheikh Mohammed and the Dubai Cares Foundation financially and the support in, con in country from both the Minister of Education along with Queen Rania with the goal of helping Jordanians uh, and helping not just Jordanian kids but also kids from Somalia, Syria, Iraq, Iran. I mean, Jordan, God bless them, a country of 8 million. Imagine if Singapore or Hong Kong where I live was to suddenly let in 2 million refugees. Well, that's what Jordan has done, and the system is so strained there that they now teach a Jordanian shift in the morning and a refugee shift in the afternoon. The country is resource poor, and I saw Queen Rania speak at Clinton Global a couple of years ago, and she said, please help us to remain welcoming. So I'm very proud of the fact that last year we added our 33rd language, and we have these beautiful Arabic language books now that are written by Jordanian 
and Syrian authors and artists. And my favorite one, if I could tell you in 15 seconds, this one book was written by a young man, and it was called The Plane That Dropped Love. And in the beginning of the book, there's a young boy walking. He's asking his mom, why is that building on fire? She says, that's what happens when people forget what unites them and only focus on their differences. And then she sees kids, he sees kids in wheelchairs and people on crutches. Mom, what happened? And his mom explains that that airplane had dropped a barrel bomb. And then he said, well, mom, I want to be a pilot. And his mother looked at him quizzically of, why would you want to be a pilot? They're doing all these evil things. And he went to his, got his construction paper and he started and he designed an airplane. He said, mom, look at my airplane. And the first scene is airplanes dropping candy. And all the kids are catching the candy. And the next, the airplane's dropping smiley faces. And the next page, the plane is dropping hearts. And he said, Mom, I've designed a plane that drops love. And I think as, all, as leaders, we all need to design anything we can design that drops love on the world. That's the mantle of leadership. That's the blessing of leadership. We've all been endowed with incredible talents and incredible opportunities. The question now for me is really simple. How do we give back? What do we want our legacy to be? And are we going to leave the earth on our last day proud of what we've accomplished? If you can answer those questions, then I think you'll be a great leader. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully answering sure. the firm. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, it, when it comes to education, Eagle, I know World Quaint has its own um, educational uh, uh, you know, enterprises. You've got a university. You've even got a leadership institute. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, the leadership institute, for instance, you've got the help of General McChrystal, don't you? So tell yes. us how you intend to sort of create leaders of the future. Yeah, well, we believe that a big part of uh, being a leader is producing uh, other leaders to rise up within the organization. And uh, that's why we, uh, you know, we've known uh, General McChrystal for, for, for a long time and we've worked with him uh, to implement uh, structures within our company. So we decided to create this uh, leadership institute that's designed uh, specifically to uh, identify the best people within the company and uh, to promote them as leaders and then to teach them how to create other leaders. That's, that's the Leadership Institute. And the other thing you mentioned, the World Quant University is, uh, that now has 2,500 students all over the world receiving a free, completely free master's degree in financial engineering. Uh, and uh, it's, it makes it the biggest master's of a financial engineering program in the world. And it's free. Yeah. Yeah, and you should be distributing some of John's books as well. But it's a master's degree, you said, didn't you? <laughs> so, <laughs> great. Now, at this stage, we've got about uh, just under six minutes. So um, we've got a couple of live polls. I don't know how many of you have actually downloaded the, the app. Show of hands. How many of you got the app? OK, quite a lot of you then. So I will go ahead and do this live poll. Um, you'll see three questions at the, uh, the bottom of that page uh, for our session, which is all about the evolution of leadership. So if you go to the bottom of the page, the three questions, let's take a look at the first, which is uh, what are the most important qualities that make a good leader? And you've heard some of those uh, being talked about today in the session. Thank you, strong communication, passion, commitment. Positivity gets zero? I mean, come on, haven't you guys been listening to John? Uh, innovation and collaboration, okay. Interesting. Passion can be, okay, uh, yeah, with some votes for positivity, that's Yeah, great. but you just totally game the system. You just, I know. <laughs> you're vote rigging. I know, exactly, one, one should. Um, passion commitment, though, seems to be the one that is the clear winner there, and, uh, you know, thank you for that. So we, we have, uh, you know, obviously um, shown you leaders here on stage who have great passion and, and commitment to their causes. Um, should we take a look at the next one, which is... Um, there's a, another poll, if I can get into that one, if I can't seem to. To what extent has the concept of leadership changed in the last 50 years? So we talked a lot about that too, about the changing uh, role of leadership in an age of technological disruption with social media. Um, okay, to a great extent. Sure, you all, you all agree. Great. And should we quickly move on to the last one? Um, you guys are still voting though. On a scale of one to five, with five being the most, uh, how large an impact do you think accountability in the digital age has impacted the credibility of leaders? 
of course, you all feel very strongly about that, five. Great, well, thank you all for uh, voting and uh, giving us a sense of what you, what you feel. Now, fine, I think the final question, if I can get each of you to sort of sum up very quickly, um, because we've just got about three minutes. If you could define or, you know, what, what makes a good leader, the kind of advice you would give leaders in 30 seconds, what would it be? Who wants to go first? I, I think you have to be dogged and, you know, persevering in, in what you want to do. I mean, just talking about Malaysia, I mean, we changed government after 60 years, but it didn't happen overnight. It took years and years and years of work by various people, collective uh, bits of work, and then it all came to that. So um, I think for any leader, you, you can't step in into a leadership position and have everyone expect you to do things you know, immediately. It, it does take time to build the foundations for that change and to build the support and, and the types of uh, you know, supporters, people around you that would make that change sustainable and credible. Okay. Thank you, Marina. Michael? Well, I think this, the, the, the principles of leadership, as much as they're changing nowadays, I still think that you know, 100 years ago, you would still have um, some of the same things that, that you've acquired to be a, a leader. I saw it in my time, particularly at Manchester United, under Sir Alex Ferguson. Uh, he had been manager for 25 years at, at Manchester United. When I speak to the players like Ryan Giggs and Paul Scholes and David Beckham, they said he used to do, literally put the nets up before training, paint the white lines, he'd be scouting all the young players, he'd be doing the team talk, he'd be doing the tactics, he'd be doing absolutely everything. I joined later on in his career, he was more delegating, times have changed, he had doctors, he had physios, he had all these things to, to assist with him. So of course you need to adapt, but I still think the principles of leadership um, or the main principles of, will, will remain and, and serve the test of time. Okay, thank you, Michael. Igor. I think with the increasing complexity of the world, the structure of companies and thus the structure of leadership is changing. Uh, the hierarchical approach is not as efficient as a networked approach. And with a networked approach, you need uh, leaders who are more like uh, gardeners uh, who take care of the ecosystem. That's number one. And number two is that with the rise of uh, prediction and predictive technologies, every leader has to be able to use those tools and not being able to uh, use them will uh, leave somebody a step behind. Okay, John. I think everybody has a favorite Winston Churchill quote and please send me yours, john at roomtree.org. I love Winston Churchill quotes. He, Churchill was once talking about a political opponent and he said he is a very humble man and he has much to be humble about. And I try to tell myself that quote and I look at myself in the mirror in the morning. I'm like, you gotta, you gotta be humble. Uh, you gotta keep it real. When people praise you, you gotta deflect that praise and say, I'm surrounded by a great team. I'm very blessed by that. And let your team hear you giving credit. Let your team hear you celebrating. If you're being celebrated or you win an award and you're being praised, be a mirror be, be, and, and, and press, to take that out, press that out to your um, people. Uh, I think part of that is also just how you, how you treat people. I'll tell you a story. Last year when I was here at Milken, um, we were on a, I was on a panel with Joe Tsai from Alibaba and I was super excited. We were in the briefing room. He was the most down to earth guy in the world. And I watched him and he, he thanked the person who filled his water glass. And he thanked her all three times she filled his water glass. And that's for me, that's, I actually have a water glass test. I actually love to just watch people of how do you treat, how do you, the, the true quintessence of a leader is not how do you treat people who are going to be doing a quid pro quo with you business wise, it's how do you treat the taxi driver, how do you treat the doorman at the hotel, do you look them in the eye, do you say hello to them, do you thank them, not that you waste your, I mean you gotta, you gotta like, I mean, you gotta say efficient in thanking people and recognizing them, but I think part of the challenge of the digital world is we've gotten so far away from this basic human to human interaction of stopping and looking a person in the eye and thanking them. Or if you're, when my wife and I moved to Hong Kong, we made it a point that we just wanted to learn how to say 20 words in Cantonese so we could actually communicate with the taxi driver in Cantonese. Just I don't know, simple things like that, but I think when you're a leader, your people are always watching you, and I think that part of your being watched, I mean, you should just be a good person anyway for the sake of being a good person, but I hope that all of us as leaders can recognize the fact that 
there's many, many reasons that a lot of people in the world don't like current leadership. And some of it is that leadership's brought that upon itself. Well, I think we should have a big round of applause to our wonderful <laughs> panelists today. It's been incredible. It's been remarkably insightful. And I hope you all have been inspired. You'll go away with some insight to how, how to run your companies and how to run your teams. Uh, thank you once again for being an amazing audience. And uh, thank you again to the Milken team for bringing us all together here. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to moderate with you. Marina Mahatir, Michael Owen, Igor Tolchinsky, John Wood. Thank you.